and welcome to the Roundhouse Podcast with Paul Solentrop of Wichita State University Strategic Communications. Our guests are Wichita State Assistant Men's Golf Coach Josh Gliggy and golfer Michael Winslow. Michael is a sophomore. He attended St. Thomas Aquinas High School in Kansas City. Michael played in all six tournaments for the Shockers in the spring of 2022. Last fall, uh, finished in a tie for 10th in the Greer Jones Shocker Invitational and tied for 23rd in the Ram Masters in- Invitational in Fort Collins. Josh is a former golfer at Texas A&M and Boise State. He came on board at Wichita State in 2021. The Shockers opened their spring schedule on February 10th in Palm Desert, California. So let's start with kind of the big picture stuff, Josh. So Wichita State returns three golfers who were on the uh, in the lineup at the conference tournament last spring, added three newcomers. Give us a kind of quick rundown of the fall and, and how that sets up for this team this spring. You know, I don't think uh, any of our guys would tell you that we played the way we wanted to in the fall. Um, I think everyone believes that we are better this year and our ranking does not reflect that right now. Um, the, guys who all played would be the first ones to tell you that they've said it all spring so um, I think everyone's excited to get back this spring and show us what we can actually do Um, hopefully go start off the season with a win in Palm Desert and uh, we got a great schedule uh, playing a lot of cool golf courses playing against some really good teams um, especially to start off the year so I think uh, I think everyone's excited to kind of avenge the fall a little bit Mike do you agree what was your view of the fall performance I mean, I would I would completely agree with Josh. I think uh, I mean I played all the events in the fall. I mean, um, you know, we just we we struggled around the edges and just didn't quite put around uh, you know a full tournament around together. So um, I think uh, Josh hits it spot on. I think we we are ready to avenge the uh, definitely in the fall. Um, we have a lot of talent on the team for sure, and um, I think. With the chemistry on our team, I think we we work really well together, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we if we play really well in conference and even you know probably get up to um, to win the conference this year. I, I believe that. So, so Mike, the golf schedule is fairly unique in college athletics because you do have the fall schedule, then you take off time, you have holiday break, then you come back and you're you know, trying to get up and running for the spring. Give us an idea about how, what's your ramp-up routine? What's the practice plan to try to get you ready for, for the tournaments in the spring? Um, I would say, so obviously we have a, I mean, we go from spring to summer to fall, all is the golf season. Um, now, like high school, I mean, uh, just spring and summer really, and fall was kind of like, you know, fall and winter, we were off season. But now in college golf, you have pretty much, I mean, three-fourths of the calendar is tournament play. And so, I mean, it's always a nice thing after our last turn of the fall was take a little time off, took maybe a week or two off and, you know, hit a few balls, but nothing nothing too crazy. And when after the semester was over, I went down to Florida for two weeks and um, was got some good weather down there and practiced for a while down in Jacksonville. So that was good and uh, worked on my game. And then um, just, you know, doing things like that, trying to get away a little bit from a little bit colder weather and such um, helps a lot. But when it comes to getting back to the semester down here and um, ramping up, just you have to go out and you know grind it out, even if it's good or bad, whatever the weather is, you still have to put in the work to be able to play well. And you're not just going to get better by sitting on the couch and watching TV if it's cold out, you know. So if you want to be the best, you got to do that for sure. So that's the biggest thing I'd say. So, Josh, from a coach's perspective, once the fall tournament seasons are over, how do you kind of direct and, and keep guys, you know, playing and in good shape and improving? Yeah, it's hard because they go so hard from now, January, middle of January until the end of October. And summer is off season for college golf, but it's not off season for golf. Um, all our guys play events all summer long, so they're going hard for 10 months. So we try to relax in that time, um, keep them keep having practice, keep trying to work at stuff, but at the same time, make sure to take time off because it's how guys begin to dislike golf. We, you want to come back in the spring and be ready and be in the right mindset to work for 10 months straight. Um, so we, we try to make it a little more fun in the fall and it's a, it's a hard balance. One of the hardest things I've had to learn as a coach is try to balance the off season because you want them to work and you want practices to be effective, but at the same time, you don't want guys to burn out because I know what that's like trying to practice golf when you don't want to. It's hard to have any focus and um, get anything out of it. So 
we were just trying to balance, make it fun, but um, still try to make it worth it. And so I told all the guys, go home for winter break, and then right at the new year, start getting back. So that way we're ready to go when they show up day one on campus this spring. And they've done a good job. I mean, Mike's leading qualifying by four, so it shows he's been working hard. And Lucas has been playing great, too. So same thing. He was sending me swing videos all winter break, so I know that he's been working. Um, and that's not to say the other guys aren't, but – um, kind of early in the season, it's it's easy to see who's uh, who's put in work over the winter. That's for sure. So busy summer. Both of you competed in the U.S. Amateur last summer, uh, went in playoffs to get in the get in the the big event. Josh qualified out of Pullman, Washington. Mike out of Overland Park. Uh, describe that experience. You, the tournament was at Ridgewood Country Club. Describe the experience, Mike. I'll let you start. What, what's that like as a young golfer playing in that kind of a tournament? I mean, really, I mean. USAM I've always thought of as, you know, the major of amateur golf. And so just thinking about that, you know, competing in that and being a part of that field this year was, I mean, was awesome. I mean, the golf course itself was one of the tougher courses I've played in my life. Um, I played a U.S. junior in the past, and that was tough, but I'd say definitely um, this year's AM was very, very tough. Um, and that it shows to me, like, what things I need to work on and such to be up there. I mean, I was obviously one of the guys that were there, but um, it shows me what I needed to work on and improve in the future. So, I mean, all in all, the experience was great. Um, definitely one to put on my schedule next year again. I'd love to play again in Colorado this year. And um, I mean, it was awesome. But I, I didn't, I mean, I kind of got a little starstruck in a way for my first one. Unlike, you know, I remember Will Zalatoris saying the first time I played in the Masters. I mean, he finished second place, and he's like, I'm not going to let it just, you know, um, immerse me in this whole situation. I'm just going to let it go and uh, play golf, and at the end of the day, it's what you got to do. So, I mean, um, I think that's something also to work on is when you get in those big tournaments is make sure that you do your right things and uh, just play your game and not get caught up in the media or whatever is going on. So I'd say that's the biggest thing that I've learned this, this year from that, and the experience itself was awesome. So... And Shocker coach Judd Easterling caddied for you, correct? Yeah. What, Judd, was, what was that like having him nearby? It was awesome. I mean, Judd's, I mean, an awesome coach and um, great guy. And we, I mean, we worked pretty well together. It was the first time he's caddied for me, but I mean, we've obviously worked together through um, not just practice, but also when we're on the road, he comes out and uh, helps us on the course and such. So, I mean, it was pretty much, it was very like, um, I'd say easy to get along, you know, it's not like someone random or a local caddy that you don't really know or um, know their routines, I guess. And so he was great to have on the bag. Um, definitely not fired, I would say. He's he's still he's still on the the roster, I would say for sure. But um, I had a great time with him for sure, and and such. Is that fairly standard? Were there other college golfers with their coaches caddying for them? So for sure. I mean, that's what um, I know. I was talking to Josh because um, when I qualified, he had this qualifier like couple days later I think and so I was talking to Judd and Josh and they're like well one of us will either caddy or if you want us to caddy and then Josh texted me and he qualified and I was like let's go and so I was like well why not do Judd and um, my brother actually came up and did some of the practice round stuff and he plays uh, professional golf so I mean he helped a lot around the edges on that side of things too but um, all in all I mean coach having your coach on the bag for sure with you know, you see them every day of practice, and when you're down here, it's very home-like feeling in a way on the course, for sure. So, Josh, you advanced to the round of 32 before losing in match play. Uh, describe that experience for you. It was one of the best weeks of my life. Uh, I qualified. I've only ever played one USAM before, and it was uh, going into my freshman year of college, so it's been seven, eight years. and um, So I had no expectations getting there. I was just so happy to be there, and that's probably the best way to play golf I've learned is uh, going out there with nothing to lose. And I don't get to play as much golf as uh, most people would expect being the assistant coach. So I only play a couple times a month. And so I, I had no idea that my game was going to be there and it kind of showed up. And like Mike said, that golf course was one of the toughest golf courses I've ever played. Um, and that fits my style of golf. I don't make very many birdies, but I don't make very many bogeys. And so I was just, I was just loving every moment of it and enjoying it. And that takes a lot of pressure off when you're not living and dying by every shot. So I think that's kind of part of the reason I played well. 
um, in it let me know that I, you know, I can still go out and play golf and at a high level when I want. And, um, yeah, it was, I, my goal, my whole life has been to hit a shot on TV. And that was one of the coolest things was people text me after the round of their TV screen, me making a putt and shaking hands on 18 and winning my match in the first round. And, um, yeah, unfortunately I ran into Derek Kitchener, who's one of the, I mean, I think one of the five or 10 best amateurs in the country right now that he, he played so well this summer but you know I, I didn't even care that I lost I was just so happy my family was up there watching my girlfriend came up and um yeah with Mike being there and he took Judd from caddy for me so I, I was gonna have Judd caddy if he didn't and um so I was carrying my own bag and I was out there by myself but just just being out there like my I mean it's it's the major of amateur golf it's the peak and I mean the winner get top two guys getting the masters and so I I would have never guess at the beginning of the week that I would have even made match play so I mean if I could ever get back just even qualify for the tournament it's that's a that's another big goal of mine in the future. Derek Kitchener you mentioned he went on and advanced to the semifinals before uh, before losing uh, so you two are roommates when the Shockers travel tell us how how does that work how's that get set up how do you choose roommates and then who who does what who sets the alarm who chooses the TV show how, how does that whole pairing work well, when I got here I guess a semester before Mike did and so I, I tried to tried to mix up my roommates kind of get to know the guys better and then when Mike got here the first term of the fall or the first tournament of last spring I think or maybe it was the second one I was like yeah I'll try I'll try Mike this time and we were on a similar schedule. We both like to sit there and turn on whatever games on TV and watch that. And um, I like the same stuff, so have it's easy to talk to them in the room versus um, sitting there with nothing to talk about. And so it was pretty natural. And I think he played well in the first event we roomed together. And so I was like, yeah, we'll just keep it going. Why not? Yeah, I mean, we've had some great times for sure. I mean. You don't get, I mean, it's always fun uh, rooming with someone you knew and such, but Josh and I have, you know, since the first time, it was a blast, I would say. And, I mean, we have a lot of similar likes for sure. I mean, Josh and I sit there and talk about whatever's going on or we could, you know, we go into some deep combos sometimes or just random things that are going on and such. But I think sometimes some of my favorite moments are definitely when uh, – we have to. We usually post um, Instagram stories of the swings and such each um, the night, the practice round um, after the practice round, the day before the tournament. And so I'm always like, "What what genre of music or what are we doing?" Or yeah, for what, those who haven't seen it, we every practice round I video every guy's swing and we choose a theme for the song that goes over the top of it. And yeah. I can't pick it on my own. So we sit there for an hour or sometimes <laughs> scrolling through playlists. We're like, what, what's Dawson going to get? What's Luke going to get? What's, what's Aston? And yeah, yeah. That, that entertains us for a good hour most times before the practice round. And kind of, I mean, it takes your mind off the tournament too. It's kind of thinking about something fun and pointless. And so that's kind of my goal. I mean, yeah, he's the unlucky one who has to room with his assistant coach, but I try to take his mind off golf as much as we can because everybody's nervous the night before the first round or before tournament so that's why it's like I mean I couldn't tell you some of the topics we've gone into because it's so random and but that's my my goal is to make it light and easy for him and not not take it too serious I think because that's when we play well do the golfers ever get to pick the music for their Instagram post or do you totally that's your choice they give me some ideas we'll tell them I, sometimes I'm, we decide on the theme beforehand I'm like if you guys want this and you know, Instagram limits, they don't have every song out there. And Dawson likes to pick his music, but I, they seem to never have his songs or they're, uh, <laughs> or they're too foul for, for the team Instagram account. We got to keep it uh, PG. PG so. Yeah, got to be appropriate. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's the hardest thing sometimes, finding good music with that that the guys like. And so I, I try to, it's pretty, that's something everybody should pay attention to in the spring because the guys like it and they think it's funny. Yeah, okay. definitely, definitely the funniest one was. Josh is a big Taylor Swift fan, yep. and <clears throat> and so uh, when Taylor dropped her new album this fall, it was like, all right, we know this. Like this was like a month before. He's like, I know yeah. this tournament, we're definitely doing um, the new album or whatever. Yeah, it was. I, was, I was looking forward to that. <coughs> Let's get all Taylor Swift down. Yeah, we do that. We do '90s rock and like, like 2000s pop. Or when we were in Texas, we did Texas theme songs. <coughs> and yeah. yeah, yeah, it's great. And this is the Wichita State golf team instagram account yep. right. always so on the stories can... the night before a tournament so that way 
it's kind of fun. Let the guys, let everybody see the guys' swings, hit the lineup, um, and then remind everyone that we have a tournament tomorrow and to follow along on Golf Stat to support the guys. Who's got the best taste in music on this <coughs> team, Mike? That's a great question. Um, probably, ooh, that's a good question. I mean, does anyone? Th- yeah, that's a, like, I don't even know. Like, honestly, Josh could be up there. Josh has always got, like, so I, I mean, if we room together, usually he's driving the car too. And so whatever music's playing in there is usually pretty good. Um, I know, what is, he introduced, like, Tyler, uh, what is it? Chil- child chillers yeah all the texas country yeah he introduced that to me that was i man, i love he's one of my favorites now um like just like i guess at home though like some of the guys have some good playlists that are just like that we listen to or whatever but maybe like tate's is pretty good sometimes i'd say he's got some funny music that's for sure he's got some funny songs for sure um i mean my my i'm just like everything like I don't know. My pit playlists are like fine, but I just kind of like steal other people's playlists in a way nobody's, too. Nobody's telling you to get on the ox. No, no, no one's. I'm not first in line for sure, but I want to be sometimes. But it's just it doesn't work. So this is similar to the baseball players, the softball players get to pick their walk up music or their music yeah. coming out of the bullpen. This exactly. is kind of the golf equivalent of that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So Mike, you come from a big golf family. You mentioned that earlier. Your father Tony golfed in college. Your brother is playing professionally after golfing collegiately uh, at Iowa and at South Florida. Your sister played at Northern Colorado. How, how does growing up in a big golf family, how's that shaped your, your golf life? It's been, I mean, it's been an awesome experience for me. Um, when you have family with, you know, in your sport and such, it's always, you know, besides golf, I mean, like, always hanging out with your family is a great thing. So that was also, I mean, some great memories on the course growing up. But, I mean, when I was a kid, um, I just was kind of like, my dad just brought me out to the course because my sister's eight years older than me and my brother's 10 years older than me. So I'm young, the youngest by a lot. And so I was a little kid just running around on the, you know, the practice tee or whatever, just messing around. And I think once I got to that age, probably five or six, I was like, I actually want to play and because I just enjoyed being out there. And so I think that's also something that's carried throughout my career is just, you know, enjoying being out the course and being in God's nature and such. And so I think having a family that, and my dad was a teaching pro too, and so he taught me playing golf. And um, it's just been a great experience all, all in all with family and um, the sport itself too. So, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, and the biggest memory I probably have, so there was just a uh, whole one at Shadow Glen, it's the course I grew up at. There was like a little piece of water that was probably like 20 or 30 yards wide. So you tee off behind it and head into the fairway. And so when I was a kid, I obviously can't hit it very far. So my dad, every single time I'd come out when I was a kid, he'd be like, all right, let's go down to the, to the first hole and see if you can hit over the water. And so, like, obviously hitting the water a bunch when I was a kid, but I probably have, like, eight or nine balls in my room still at home that, like, I signed and dated of, like, the ones that flew over the water. And so I think something like that was really special growing up, too, is, like, having those memories and, um, still having those to this day. so You get a lot of variance in how golf parents can uh, enjoy their, their son or daughter's rounds. Some of them are nervous. They're pacing. They go walk behind a tree. Uh, you yeah. know, others are, are more chill or more locked in or are watching everything. How would you describe your parents? How do they consume your, your golf rounds? I'd say pretty good. Um, they, don't, they know if they show you know, negative emotions, if I'm playing bad, it's not going to help me. So I think... They just kind of are pretty laid back, stay out of the way. My parents like to walk up in front of me to, you know, either spot or, you know, just kind of not be in the way at all. And so um, I think that's been good. I mean, obviously they're excited when I play well and um, want to help me the most when I don't play well. And so I think it's been pretty um, very fruitful of a relationship between that standpoint. Um, so, I mean, all in all, it's and it's been great. I mean. They're, they're awesome. I love when they come out to watch. They come out to most of the collegiate events. Obviously, one of my parents come in the summer when I travel. So, I mean, it's it's great having them on the road, too, for sure. So. And then throughout all sports, you know, whether it's baseball or yeah. basketball or golf, some different parents will approach it in different ways. Sometimes they want to – sometimes they and their child will want to talk through the round or the game. Other times they'll say – 
you know, no, we're going to wait. We're going to go home. There's no golf talk for two hours or until we're done yeah. with dinner. Uh, there's a lot of different dynamics about how you're going to, you know, how you're going to approach what, what just happened in the, in the game or the round. How do you do that with your parents? Um, I would say some, it just depends. Like some days it's like, all right, let's wait a little bit and talk about it. Or if it's really bad, it's like, all right, let's talk about it right now on the car ride back or whatever it is. And or at lunch after the round or whatever is happening. And usually it ends up, you know, going practicing, whatever it is. And I mean, there, there's been some heated conversation, obviously, but you know, that, that shows that you care and my parents care about me and my success. And so I think that's, that's awesome. I mean, at the moment, at, in the moment you're, you know, obviously frustrated and probably don't like each other at the second, but, um, at the end of the day, when you set, take a step back and look at it, it's just like, wow, like, I'm happy that they, they care that much about um, how you're doing and, you know, how to be better in your, in your um, sport. So, Mike, your golf game, where do you think you've improved the most in your time at Wichita State? Um, I'd, say, I'd say recently I've definitely improved swing-wise. Um, I think from last spring to this, spring, this beginning of spring, I think my swings uh, definitely increased, like, speed and – um, I'd say my shot like dispersion is definitely narrowed into more straighter and you know hitting less less wayward shots I'd say um, my my short game's always been pretty good throughout my life I'd say it's you know obviously incrementally increasing and but I'd say one of the biggest things is like I always look each year back to like a time or whatever you know if I play the same course or what happened and rate kind of like okay this round I know I didn't play well and if I didn't play well today and my strokes, you know, it's improving to my average of scoring, I'd say for sure. Like my scoring average, if I don't play well, has is, is definitely been um, on the better side of, you know, closer to par instead of, you know, um, I guess last year it's been, it was a little bit worse. Hi, this is Rick Muma, president of Wichita State University. Check out the latest episode of the Forward Together podcast. Each episode, I sit down with different guests from Shocker Nation to celebrate the vision and mission of Wichita State University. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Josh, give us a scouting report on Mike's golf game. <clears throat> Mike kind of nailed it. Um, when he came to campus, you know, his short game was was really nice. Um, best on the team right away, I thought. Um, his putting has improved a lot in the last year. That's something he's worked really hard on um, that him and I have worked a lot on. And I always heard that he could get really hot with the putter and um, make a ton of putts and kind of cold here and there. And, I think he's become a lot more consistent to where the, he still gets hot, but the colds aren't as cold, um, which is a big key in putting. And then his ball striking over the last year has improved tremendously. Um, I know in the spring he was he was really struggling with some some of his irons, his long irons, and hit some pretty gross shots, he would tell you. <laughs> and now it's kind of, you know, if you want someone to step up and hit a tight fairway or hit a long iron into a tough pin, like he's he can do it went a way higher rate than last spring. I mean, the, the change in his ball striking in the last year is is incredible to where it was. I mean, so he's one of those guys who's – it's going to be pretty hard for him to shoot above 75. Like, a lot has to go wrong outside of his control because he just doesn't miss very often, which is why he's played every event for us. Mike, what's what's the favorite golf course you've played? Um, let's see. I'd probably say – I'll give you – I mm, Prairie Dunes is definitely – up there Prairie Dunes and Hutchinson yep and there's another course so there's this course down in Jacksonville Florida it's called Pablo Creek Golf Club it's phenomenal it's on uh, Pablo Creek down there and it's um it's 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 fantastic but I mean a more notable one would probably be Baltusrol for sure so Josh how about you Prairie Dunes is up there that's one of the that's the highest ranked course I've played um describe Prairie Dunes for it's it's yeah. Quite unique. So Perry Dunes is an old, it's Perry Maxwell, one of the most notable designers, especially in this part of the country. Probably most people would say top five of all time. Um, 
So he he, uh, he used the land. There was almost no land moved, and they have a, a little, I guess, shovel yeah. on 17 yeah. out there to show, like, this is how we move the land, and it's tiny. So the land is just perfect for a golf course. And, you know, there's not a lot of trees, but the slope uh, is a big deal out there. you got to know how to use the slopes, and um, the wind's always kind of blowing. And, I mean, for – me coming to Kansas without ever being here, the views out there are amazing. I mean, there's some high points out there, and you can see the whole golf course, and it, it's just one of the most special places I've been out there, just for the history of it, for playing a Perry Maxwell golf course. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I absolutely love it, um, which I've been fortunate enough to play that twice. Hope to go back. Uh, it's hard to get on, but I hope to go back and. My other favorite is probably Blue Jack National, which is a Tiger Woods design outside of Houston, Texas. Um, it's like a, it's a very laid back golf course. You can do whatever you want. When I, when we played in school, we used to play eight sums out there. Just take cards, drive wherever, um, do whatever you want. And it's, it's basically, it's like a flatter Augusta National. You feel like you're at Augusta when you're out there. So if I were to play two rounds, the last two places before I die, it's, it's gotta be those two. So, Josh, your college golf career is still fresh. You just wrapped up in 2021 at Boise State. How, how does being that close in age to the people on the team, how does that help help coach them? Yeah, you know, everyone I've heard, it's uh, it was going to be a challenge being young, and that's kind of uh, a barrier I've had to overcome. But the way I see it is players are changing from the old days where you don't necessarily need to – be hard on them all the time, yell at them. It's not, it's not the way coaching used to be, I think. So being young, I think, is a strength because I can relate to what they're going through. I, the feelings are fresh on how they're feeling on the golf course, how they feel about going to workouts, going to school, and have, have being busy from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, so I understand that better. Um, and just being able to relate to everything, I think, is a huge strength to me that, you know, and – 30 years I'm, I, I won't quite have so that's why I think being a young coach um, especially not having to be the one to yell at them when they do something wrong um, I think it's a great strength is to help them because they, they trust me they they, uh, they know I was just there and they understand that I'm still a good player so when I tell them something they I think take it to heart because I want they know I want the best for them and they know what I know what I'm talking about um, which is important to Judd is having an assistant coach who can play high-level golf for that reason. Um, my head coach, when I was in school, never played golf, which is kind of crazy because he's in the Hall of Fame, won national championship. Um, so he kind of had the same idea as Judd is, man, I need an assistant coach who can play. And my assistant coach was a great player, and everybody listened to him all the time. So I think being young and uh, still being a good player is kind of my two strengths as a coach as opposed to – Viewing as a negative, I, I like to look at it as a, as a positive. Yeah, so Mike, from a player's perspective, I guess what's most interesting is Josh is still out there. He was in the U.S. Amateur this summer. Does that help him coaching? Does that help get guys to, to listen, to pay attention? Oh, for sure. I would say, I mean, we obviously Josh and I have played many rounds together here in Wichita and um, even on the road um, down in Texas this fall. We even played together in the, just for a fun round. And so, I mean, I mean, I've looked up to Josh's game for sure. I mean, he played at A&M, one of the best um, schools in the country when he played. And um, so, I mean, his game is, I mean, one of the best. If you're playing on the team, you, you're one of the best out there. So I think having that aspect of, you know, not just past results, but, I mean, he's still a great player to this day. I mean, made like you said, made the round of 32 in the USAM this year. I mean, that's phenomenal playing. And I think having that, like, as a coach, you know, he's going to give you great advice. He's going to – you know, he's had his, um, you know, he's learned from his uh, failures, you know, he's, he knows what um, to do. And so I think giving that advice to us week to week and in practice or on the road is, is important to being successful as a player too, is when you have someone looking out for you and your, um, your game, I think that's, that's important to have for sure. So Josh, Mike is a uh, team captain. Tell us, uh, he's only been here, I guess he's just over a year now. Uh, tell us how that reflects, uh, I guess, his respect, his maturity on the team. Yeah, and, you know, he came in last spring midway through the year, which is unusual for golf. 
But after being only here one semester, his teammates voted him one of the two team captains along with Dawson Lewis, who's fifth year senior. So I think to be looped in with Dawson there is a sign of how much his teammates respect him because all those guys look up to Dawson. And so for them to have the same opinion of Mike as they do Dawson says a lot about him. And I mean, he's way more mature. I told you the other day, he doesn't seem like a 19, 19? Yeah. 19 19. year old kid. So we can trust him to keep other guys accountable. We trust him on the road. We trust him to play with donors or the athletic director if we need him to. Um, And his teammates see that as well as us. And so, I I mean, it's not very often because technically, I guess, still a freshman this last fall being only here for one semester to be a team captain says a lot about him. So, Mike, we've got three Texans on the Shocker roster, three Kansans on the Shocker roster. Take us through some of the NFL banter that's going on during the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, it was a a tough, tough weekend for a few of those guys for sure with the Cowboys loss. I mean, I'd say Aston and Dawson. We were, we were watching in our living room. I live with Aston and Dawson, and um, they were definitely down bad. I'd say uh, there wasn't very many words said after that game, for sure. And obviously me being a Kansas City guy, I'm a big Chiefs guy. So um, obviously I'm a little afraid of this weekend, but um, I think this year we're going to beat the Bengals. And so I think um, it's fun, though. I mean, it's fun having other guys that are uh, fans of other teams because you guys can go back and forth and, you know, uh, give each other crap for, you know, who's who's who. And, um, you know, like Aston, he's uh, – He's not a fan of Dak right now, and so he's he's been just clowning him recently and such. And um, it's been it's been pretty funny to be around for sure. It's it's always fun, you know, having that kind of stuff off the course to just kind of like you know take your mind off of golf and you know have fun. You know, that's that's the biggest thing too. And are you kind and considerate when your friends are struggling with their NFL team, or do you do you rub it in a little bit? Um, I. There's a little bit of both, I'd say. I've never wanted to be that guy that just, like, makes fun of everything. I mean, obviously the Cowboys had a great year still. I think, you know, they obviously previous years have not been as good. And so I don't I don't think I'd – I wouldn't say I would rub it in as much to be nice about it. But, um, you know, I, I respect their team still. I mean, maybe not as much as the Chiefs, but um, – so I think I think I'm pretty good about it still. I don't think I said anything that would hurt them that well, much. This and I think weekend. if there's if there's any franchise that kind of invites that kind of uh, teasing, it would be the Dallas Cowboys. It, I think it's everybody. Pretty, everybody it's the Cowboys. For, I mean, nothing nothing against anyone, but I mean, there's there's a few names that you could you could list that maybe need to move on or you know new new openings need to be made for sure or looks, but um, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> you hit that spot on. I'd say the Cowboys are. Definitely of the NFL are the team that almost make fun of for sure. But Thank you for listening to the Roundhouse Podcast, courtesy of Wichita State University Strategic Communications. We encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can find more Roundhouse content at GoShockers.com. Bradshaw into Wingate. Wingate's going to dribble it a couple of times and throws it in the hands of Kuznar. Threw it away. Kuznar to Ryan Martin for the dunk. The Shockers are going to the Sweet 16. It's all over. The Shockers up seven. Three seconds. Two. Jumper by Smith is no good. Wichita State to the Sweet 16. (laughs)